everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Callie Lerner, and I'm a marketing associate at Streetlight Data. I'm joined today by Catherine Manzo, our Senior Director of Customer Success. Before we get started, I wanted to let you all know that this webinar is being recorded, and we'll send out a link to the webinar and the webinar slide and information about the free trial in about 24 hours. If you have any questions during the webinar, please be sure to ask us using WebEx's questions feature. You should see this module on the control panel. Just type your question and send it to all, and we'll answer it at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Catherine. Thanks, Callie. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I'm good. Great. Well, um, welcome, everyone, and thank you again for joining us today. Um, we are going to cover a few different topics in the webinar over the next hour. I will start with an introduction to Streetlight Data and then jump into our Streetlight Insight OD scanner and share with you some results we found in the Austin, Texas area. We'll then talk about how all of you can get a free trial of the OD scanner. And last but not least, we will leave plenty of time for Q&A. And like Tally mentioned, please use the question function of WebEx, and we'll be compiling those questions throughout the course of the webinar and then make sure to answer all of them at the end. So thanks again for joining, um, and let's dive right in. Seeing my data in a nutshell um, simplifies data-driven infrastructure and policy planning by providing the best big data resources and software together. We currently have coverage that spans all of North America. We have trips starting in about 97% of all of the block groups in the United States and over 79% of the Canadian dissemination areas, including in the less populous areas. We have customers all across North America running hundreds and thousands of analyses every month um, across many, many states and provinces cities and regions. So in terms of big data, we all know that it is a very hot buzzword and has been for, for a while. And big data is pretty cool. Um, at Streamlight Data, we've got a lot of it. This video is showing you a sample of about 24 hours in San Bernardino, California. The purple dots are smartphone apps um, hanging locationally in the background. And this data comes to us de-identified and all fully opted in to protect privacy. The orange dots are from GPS management devices in commercial trucks. Throughout the day, you saw the activity rose and fall and fell in various parts of the city. And we mix this data with all sorts of other more conventional data, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And this video is pretty and fun to watch. Um, but it's actually not that useful because it's just a pile of data, although a pretty animated pile. But we believe that big data alone is not useful. Um, so here is some of those other types of conventional data I mentioned that we're using. Things like road network, parcel, and land use data, as well as demographics. And what we do at Streetlight and with our Streetlight Insights platform is turn this raw data into actionable transportation analytics. As you can see on the left, we're using that geospatial big data for mobile devices that I just showed you in that video, and also contextualizing that contextual data or contextualizing data. All of this data gets processed algorithmically into metrics. We're using advanced machine learning techniques and many other approaches to develop our algorithms. Once this data is processed, it's all stored up in the cloud. And we have highly efficient, parallelized cloud infrastructure that enables very fast processing speeds for Streetlight Insight users. So when you log in and use the platform, it taps into this infrastructure stored process travel pattern data to generate analytics exactly as you want them. So that is a very fast overview of the Streetlight Insight technology. And if you have more questions about that, happy to cover more of that in the Q&A session at the end. 
But now let's jump into the Streetlight Insight OD scanner. Quite simply, what this allows you to do is choose a segment, and our platform gives you a breakdown of all of the origin and destination of trips that pass through. That's it. Sounds pretty simple, but there's a lot more to it. You can run this on any roadway in North America, big or small, urban or rural. And our system doesn't have set types of roadways it can use. You, as the user, get to define the road however you'd like. And when you use Streetlight's OD scanner, not only are you getting a comprehensive sample of actual origins and destinations, as opposed to, say, someone's recollection of their behavior, but it's also incredibly easy to set it up and you get back results in minutes to hours. And really, it is the fastest way to use Streetlight's huge trip database. And the steps are easy. First, you identify your road or roadways. Next, you select your origin and destination geography. In the U.S., the options are zip code, census block route, and census TAS, transportation analysis zone. In Canada, the option is dissemination areas. And then you have the results back um, quickly, and you can explore uh, the results in no time. Here are a few of the top use cases for our OD scanner we've heard from our customers. Everything from transportation demand management, strategy prioritization, to public engagement, to research. And I'll be interested to hear from all of you if there are other use cases relevant for your agency or project. To show you guys all how our OD scanner works, we decided to analyze travel patterns in Austin, the capital of Texas. I'm sure many of you have been to Austin before. It's a beautiful city. And as you can see here, the geography is characterized by the um, Colorado River. A few other fun facts about the area. It's the 11th most populous city in the United States and the fourth most populous city in Texas. And it's also one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. From 2006 to 2016, one decade, the population grew by more than 35%. I don't even tell all of you that uh, that type of rapid population growth obviously has major implications for the transportation network. The most important interstate highway in Austin is um, Interstate 35, which you can see right here. This highway connects Austin to major cities like San Antonio to the south, also Dallas and Fort Worth up to the north, and it runs right through the city of Austin as well. Um, and in that nutshell, it's really a critical and important route for mobility, not only within the city of Austin, but the entire region. And it's in part because of the growth that Austin has experienced, not to mention that nearby San Antonio was the fastest growing city in the U.S. last year, um, that because of all of these factors, through Central Texas is one of the most congested highways in Texas. And to quote um, TxDOT, quote, it serves as the backbone of our local, regional, and national transportation network, and lack of mobility on I-35 is threatening the economic livelihood of our community and our state. Improvements to this 50-year-old interstate are required to address the increased congestion and travel time delay due to population and employment growth. That's a pretty meaty statement, and, and obviously this is a critical area for Texas, and I imagine that the sentiment is about congestion and delay and the impact economically on a region will resonate with folks all across the U.S. and Canada. So for all of these reasons, that's why we decided to focus in on this area. It sounds really interesting. And um, TxDOT, the Texas State DO team, and local agencies have initiated some major infrastructure programs for all of I-35, from Laredo in the south through Dallas and Fort Worth in the north. And there is a lot of major work going on in the 79 miles of I-35 that got through the Austin region. Multiple projects are underway right now, 
Um, and while an earlier vision to try to turn I-35 through Austin to a three-level roadway with toll lanes in the middle, I believe, has stalled, there is still a ton of work um, either currently underway or will soon be um, on the highway. So here's Streetlight with all this noise and activity around this I-35 and thought it presented us with a great opportunity to showcase our OD scan. So this is what we did. We uploaded a shape file of a little over 1,000 TMC segments to the Streetlight Insight platform. And then we scanned for the origins and destinations by zip code of all the trips that passed through each segment during just one month, July 2018. And all of this process very quickly, I mean, under three hours. So I want to now drill down on a few different findings on I-35 um, and talk about what that might mean for this, you know, huge infrastructure plan and work that's happening right now in Texas. So the very first thing that I did was I looked at the aggregated results. So this black line is actually showing all of those 1,079 segments, northbound and southbound, that were analyzed. So when I aggregated up all those results, these are now the top origin and then destination here on the right, zip codes of people passing through any of those segments during the a.m. peak hours on an average weekday. So that's often when a lot of travel is happening as well as things like congestion, et cetera. So when I look at the picture on the left, um, the origins I think is really interesting. You can see hot spots all throughout the region from down south all the way up north. And depending upon how your screen shows, there should be differing colors of red, orange, yellow, green, and blue to show the gradient of where trips are starting. So hotter or redder means more trips. Lighter, bluer means fewer. The destinations perhaps are not all that surprising, given that this is the AMP on a weekday. Folks are trying to get to downtown Austin, the major business center, and um, also um, where, you know, the Capitol building is and, and all the jobs associated with that. So after I ran this, it took me just a few minutes to explore these results, and I have kind of this amazing insight into regional travel patterns. If this webinar was a lot longer, I would do a bunch of other explorations with this. I would look at maybe other times of the day, like the PM peak or the off peak. I could also perhaps run this for other times of the year, like the winter um, or the spring versus just the month in the summer. And I could also maybe look at special travel days, such as, um, you know, a few days around the July 4th holiday or aggregating all of the weekends that the home football games are being played at UT Austin. So one of the major benefits of the Streetlight Insight platform is that it only takes a few clicks to process and then explore all of these different slices of travel behavior. So next, I decided to stay at the regional level, but wanted to look at um, data, or excuse me, over the entire day of the weekday, not just the AM peak, to get a sense for, in general, over the, a, a whole typical day, what's going on. So first, I looked at the all of the segments together again, aggregated kind of regardless of, of direction of travel, and now we see some interesting things. Downtown Austin is still showing up as a hot spot, but it's not the only one. There's a lot more darker oranges down here to San Marcos, up north as well. So the actual destinations of, of people is more widespread when we look at the entire day. Very interesting. Um, and when I look at the specific directions of travel, like southbound only and northbound only, a lot of other things jump out at me. Most notably, when we look at southbound, Austin is not the only hot spot. Kyle, San Marcos are just as right now um, in terms of being a top destination for folks trying to go. And when we look at where people are trying to get to when they're heading north, Austin, downtown, yeah, it pops a little bit on the map, but it's really farther north up here um, by Round Rock in that area up here. So again, quickly, I've now, with very little work on my end, have incredible insights into these regional 
transportation patterns. I could literally spend hours just exploring that regional travel behavior, but I also wanted to look at one of the specific projects that TechDOT and the Austin area MPO are working on in the northern part of the corridor. So um, it is I-35 at Wells Branch Parkway is sort of the name of the project. And what you have going on here is I-35 running right down through the middle, as well as a frontage road on either side. And the I-35 frontage road is um, a pretty important uh, roadway, kind of all up and down the entire corridor, and it comes up a lot in these projects. And then there's also this Wells Branch Parkway, as well as a FM-1825 that's all kind of coming together right here in this orange area is where they're focusing in. This project is underway, but no construction has begun yet. So this is a great time to say what other information can be gathered that could be helpful before construction actually starts off. And over here on the right are some of the bullet points taken directly from the website for the project about what they're trying to do here. They want to improve the intersection um, between the Frontage Road and Wells Branch Parkway and FM 1825. Um, there's a lot of different ways to improve the intersections, but one of them is thinking about including a bypass lane for the frontage road to allow through traffic to bypass the traffic signal. And I'm going to jump into that one in a little bit more detail in a minute. In addition, though, entrance and exit ramps on I-35, both north and south of the parkway, are going to be reconstructed. And last but not least, they're going to look at improving bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. So there's a ton of stuff going on here. Um, and like I said a minute ago, construction's not anticipated to start for a few more years. So um, a lot of time right now to think about detours, public communication, and whatnot. So let's dive in a little bit more into what I found that I thought was interesting related to this project. So first off, I thought about that reconstruction of the on and off ramps on I-35. So this means construction and disruptions for travelers. So what I decided to do was I took that huge set of road segments that I ran at I-35, and I zoomed into just four that were right north and south of that um, parkway on I-35. And it's a little bit hard to see, but it's this black, those are those black blotches right there are those segments. So what I'm looking at now is what are the top origin zip codes for folks that use those segments of I-35 on an average day. This chart on the right is actually now spelling those out, the specific zip codes, and then the share of trips by origin. So suddenly now, I have, well, if I were the communications team um, at either the NCO or TechSat, I now have really great information about where people are coming from that are going to be affected if there's any sort of construction or um, delays on this roadway. So now, doing more targeted geographic dis distribution of information about any of that upcoming work um, is going to be a lot easier, whether it's via, you know, mailers, straight to people's mailboxes, or social media postings or whatnot. Um, so from a communication standpoint, this is now suddenly a lot more information than, than I had before. Also, of course, all of the planners and engineers working on this project can look at these origins and the corresponding destinations, as well as the specific OD pairs by running something like a select link, and that can feed into thoughts around detour routes or timing of construction, um, a whole host of different things. Now, I could easily have done the exact same analysis with destinations as well, but for this example, I just kept it with the origin. And there's a whole big tail of other zip codes that, just to make the chart a little bit easier to view, I only pulled the top, I think this was six or seven. The next thing I was thinking about was that frontage road bypass that I mentioned before. So if folks are coming up the frontage road north here, and this is a one-way street, they have a few different options. You can either head east on the Wells Branch Parkway or go straight and continue on the frontage road paralleling I-35. 
or you can turn left and go west on the parkway. There's also an option before you actually get to the intersection itself, which is right up here, to um, do this little, almost a U-turn, if you will, here, to either head southbound on the frontage road or go to destinations over here. So as I was reading about and thinking about the fact that they want to put a bypass here, my understanding of that is it would allow folks that are heading north and continuing on the frontage roads to literally probably travel under this intersection and not have to stop here for traffic. Um, and because of the major east and westbound um, congestion that they're having here, um, I wanted to know, well, how much will that matter? Are a lot of people trying to do that? And I realized actually one thing I forgot to mention earlier, the whole point of all of the projects around this section of I-35 is all about safety and mobility. Heavy congestion, probably traffic signals that are too close together here and here. It's sort of the bread and butter of why most things in transportation are done, make it safer and easier for people to get around. So to answer the question about are a lot of people that are coming into this intersection trying to continue north um, on the frontage road, I use something a little bit different than our OG scanner. So rather than scan all of the zip codes or census block groups, I actually just focused in on this intersection on its own and use Streetlight Insight origin destination metrics to understand how people move through the intersection. And here's what I found. Um, this is showing the four different routes that people can take as they come on in or kind of originate into that intersection and the percentage of trips that go each route. And this was during an AMP time, but I could have easily, again, if this webinar was a lot longer, looked at um, PM peak, weekends, weekdays, et cetera. And here's what I found. In fact, 39%, the highest share of trips, are actually trying to go westbound on the parkway. But coming up right behind that, there is a large percentage of trips, 33%, that are continuing north on the frontage road. And what really surprised me, though, here, too, was that 21% did that loop to head either back south on the frontage road or to destinations over here to the west. And less than 10% were actually turning right to go east. Now, I don't know if this behavior has changed significantly since maybe initial work was done a few years ago with this project. But regardless, this is now at my fingertips um, if I'm working on this project to give more insight. And I could run the exact same analysis for this intersection on SM 825 over here and see how that maps out as well. That might help shed some insights that could be useful for prioritizing one of these bypasses sooner rather than later, um, or other um, policies that they might put in place to help with the, the, the congestion here. So that was a taste of some of the learnings we found was digging into the OD scanner results um, as well as some other analytics around I-35. Happy to answer any other questions about that in the Q&A. But now I want to spend a couple of minutes to talk about the free trial. It's quite simple. If you are interested in seeing results for roadways in your area, all you need to do is send an email to trial at streetlightdata.com. You can select up to five roadway segments in the continental United States, um, or we recommend the more populated areas of Canada, so probably farther south in the country. Um, and you can either provide us with a shape file or longitude latitude coordinates of the spot on the road that you're interested in analyzing. And then one of our team members will be in touch. We'll run the OD scanner analytics, send you the results, and also happy to set up a quick screen share and walk you through some of those heat map visualizations that I was showing you for the awesome results before. Again, very easy, no strings attached or anything like that, no paperwork to fill out. Just send us an email. Um, and a, a member of our team will um, work with you to get you those results. And now I'd like to turn it over to Q&A about anything we've talked about here today so far. 
All right, Kat. I am getting some questions in. Just as a reminder to attendees, if you have any questions, use the Q&A box in your, your uh, control panel on the right-hand side, and just let us know if you have any questions. To start us off, Kat, we've got a question um, about OD zones and if they can be self-generated or if one can use the census tract or block geography. Good question. So the answer is, um, I guess, yes to both of those. So you saw when I showed a screen a few slides back some um, what we call preset geographies that we already have uploaded in the system. Those were census block group, zip code, and transportation analysis zone, but from the census as well. In addition, the other option is to self-generate or upload your own geographies if you'd like to use track or your own um, transportation analysis zones or, I don't know, neighborhoods in your region or whatnot. So both are an option. Cool. Thanks, Kat. So then another question we've got is how do you separate grade separated roadways, for example, of Viabus going over a roadway? Sorry if I mispronounced that. Grade separated roadways. Excellent question. So if you think back to one of the very first slides where I showed you how we algorithmically process all of the data um, behind the scenes before you run an analysis through Streetlight Insight, one of the things that is part of that is looking at the road network. So we have the OpenStreetMap road network for all of North America, which we update on a regular basis as updates are made. And when we process all of the data into actual trips, we lock it to the road network. So things like overpasses or viaducts over a roadway or an intersection, we're able to lock the trips to those different OSM or OpenStreetMap layers. And we're also able to apply direction filters, depending upon which direction the trip was headed, southbound, northbound, eastbound, westbound, north, northeast, whatnot. And so the combination of those two different things allow us to easily separate out if folks are traveling on one roadway or another. Cool. All right. The next question is about the origin and reliability of the data. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So if you're in reference to the various data resources that Streetlight brings in, so first let me start with things like the contextualizing data. I mentioned OpenStreetMaps is the road network that we use here in North America as a publicly available open source or openly contributed to data resource. We also use things like parcel and land use data, some of which we do license from entities that have it for all of North America. And we also pull in demographic data from places like the U.S. Census. So all of that um, is, um, you know, very reliable um, it's data people have been using for decades and decades and decades, um, the, the demographics and whatnot. In terms of the geospatial big data, we partner with different companies that specialize in obtaining this data in the um, most privacy, appro privacy protection appropriate way possible. That's a little bit of an mouthful there. Um, so reliability-wise, what we're seeing is these data resources growing and growing and growing over time. There's more and more smartphones out there in the world, more and more apps that people are using or backgrounding on their phone, more and more connected trucks. Um, and so one of the important things that we do at Streetlight, though, is that we have a whole team of data scientists and database engineers that look, clean up, process, normalize, and make sense of all of that big data. So if there are big changes for any reason month to month or year to year, we're figuring out how to deal with that so it doesn't trickle down to our customers in any way of, of um, incorrectly providing results. Um, so that's maybe a very broad answer to that question. So if you have a more specific one, type in a follow-up and I'm happy to answer that or we can follow up after the webinar too. All right, thanks Kat. So next question is, is Census tracts are used. Could socioeconomic information be integrated? I'm interested in EJ analysis. 
Um, yeah, great question. So, and I assume by EJ, you're referring to an environmental justice type of analysis. So, most likely concerned probably about, um, you know, lower income people and people of color. Um, and um, that's, of course, something that all transportation agencies, you know, need to be concerned about that no projects are impacting one group in a way um, more than another. So, one of the beauties of what I mentioned earlier about using the demographic data, the way we process all of the raw data coming into our system is that even though we don't have any personal identifiable information about people, we don't know that it's Catherine Manto's cell phone moving around, we are able to observe the mobile phones in our system over multiple days or multiple weeks at a time. And we are able to infer where we believe that phone lives, for example. And so then based on the land use data and the demographic data we have from the census, we can then infer um, household level demographic profile. And we can then append that demographic profile onto any of the another, any of the other analyses that are being done in the system. So you can understand not only are there a lot of trips coming from, you know, a particular zip code in Texas, but what is the breakdown of household income level or race or education of those people based on that whole process I just mentioned? Cool. All right. So the next question is, when you were determining the turning movement percentage distribution for the I-35 frontage road, did you use the traditional streetlight OD tool? setting up the frontage road as origin and each movement as possible destination. Well, whoever asked that is obviously very well acquainted with Streetlight Insight, and the answer is yes. That's exactly what I did. Um, so the movement, the, the, the kind of route into the intersection was my origin, and then I had those four destinations, each of the different ways you could exit the intersection, if you will. All right, next question is, is the data source sufficiently rich enough to know if a trip through your gate is one of the string of chained trips? It's a little bit of an interesting question. Um, I don't know if I'm fully sure what the asker is trying to understand, but um, to reiterate a little bit, but to dive a little bit deeper, when we process all of the raw data, it's pins, like you saw in that video, kind of popping up and down. But when we turn all of that into trips and lock it to the road network, we're connecting all of those points, basically with vectors is an easy way to think about it, and then we lock that to the road network. So even if a connected truck or a phone didn't actually send a ping up to, you know, the satellite network, right at the moment that it crossed the threshold of a particular segment, our system still knows that it did that because the net because it pinged, you know, a few minutes previously and a few minutes after. And then when we created the trip and launched it to the roadway, it obviously passed through that segment. So that again, back to this work that we do behind the scenes. So that way, when users log in, all you have to do is say, "This is the road that I'm interested in," and don't have to worry about all that other stuff. Okay, Kat, next question is, what is a typical sample ratio, for example, the sample divided by the population of the OD data? That is an excellent question, and it's a very long answer because the answer is there's no one answer for that. So what I would actually recommend, um, we have a bunch of different resources that we've published that dive into how do you think about sample size and what does it look like for street light. And I don't know, if Tori, excuse me, Pally, if it's possible to maybe include a link to any of those in the email we send out to registrants. Because um, quite frankly, I think whoever asked that question, you're going to get a lot more information from that than me giving um, a very long-winded explanation right now. Because the answer is it varies, but it's a very important question. And um, so that's one thing I'll say, that we have a lot of resources published for that. Um, but the second thing I'll mention, too, though, is we know how important understanding sample size is for our customers. So anytime you run an analysis, everything I talked to you about today, when you download the results from Streetlight Insight, you get a bunch of files. And one of those is a CSV or Excel file that gives you the sample number of, of sort of the actual number of trips that were observed in this overall analysis. So that's a great way for each individual analysis for you to understand kind of the potential sample there. 
and chat. And yes, I can include a link and I will do that in the follow up. All right, so the next question is how, so we've got a couple questions and I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but if you could dive into it, maybe our process a little bit more. Um, we've got questions on how old or new our data is and how current it is and things like that. Ah, uh, yeah. So. One of the interesting things about this, these big data resources is that they're being generated every day. Um, so we collect data from every single day of the year. Right now, we typically process it on a monthly cadence. So we wait until the end of the month, and then we get a big dump for the whole, well, all of North America. But the, the, um, at once, we'll see in the future, we may modify that so we process things maybe on a weekly or, or every two weeks or something like that. Um, so we don't get rid of any of the older data either. It's just sitting up there in a big repository up in the cloud. And so we go back a few years. Um, some of our analytics can go back to as early as January 2014. Um, everything else can go back to January 2016 and then up to, you know, the present. And we generally right now maybe lag a month or two behind the actual month that we're in right now. Hopefully that answers the, the questions for folks. And we don't have any plans probably to, yeah, well, anyhow, that I think hopefully will answer the question. Thanks, Dad. All right, next question is, what is the resolution of OD info? Do we have different levels other than the zip code? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I use zip code just because it's easy and everyone can understand those well for this, these examples. Um, so there's a few different ways you can use, you can get, OD information via Streetlight. If you use our sort of preset options already that make it super easy for you, like I showed you just put in a roadway and get back the answer, then you have the option of zip code census block group or census TAS, transportation analysis zone. But you always also have the option to just upload any other type of geography you want to use. So if your agency has their own transportation analysis zone, um, neighborhoods, um, census tracts, I can't even think of another geography right now, um, that you'd like to use, absolutely you can use that as well. Um, there's no limitations. You can get very, very granular um, um, when running these analyses. Next question is about the validation methodology that we use for OD. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so this is absolutely critical. All You can't use these big data resources if, they, if you don't think that the answers are right, right? Um, so Streetlight does a lot of different validation work all throughout the process of processing all of our raw data to releasing new analytics to our customers, um, and then after they're out there in the world, asking customers to continue to help validate to make sure our algorithms are working as best as possible, and as we continue to improve and iterate on our algorithms. So that's the high-level answer that it's very important. In terms of more specifically what we do, we also have a lot of published information, white papers and whatnot, that really dive into this in more detail. So if you have a specific type of validation you're curious about, we can follow up with you after that. But the, the, the simple answer is we look for other conventionally collected sources of data that are ground truth that we can compare it to. Um, and most recently, actually, we've been doing this and talking about it a lot, not, really, not as it relates to OD, but actually as it relates to traffic counts and AADT. So that's where we've done, most recently, you've seen a lot of um, information on our blog or, or other things through our email list about that. Um, but the, the, the bottom line is we're continually doing this validation work. And a validation white paper that is also publicly available um, for folks to download off our website dives into some examples of comparing OD results with things like license plate surveys in places like California and other analyses to see how our results matched up and they are, are very good. Um, and we've also had customers do much more granular analyses, like that intersection analysis I showed you. We had a customer in Minnesota compare it to conventionally collected um, intersection analysis information for um, not Texas, for Minneapolis, and the percentages were, you know, virtually identical. So that is what's happening 
we do these massive validations. Customers do these smaller validations to help us continually improve. All right, next question is, when I perform any analysis in Streetlight Insight, is it possible to get an understanding of the amount of coverage in the geographic area or level of certainty in the results? As I mentioned before, any analysis that you run, you do get a sample size file um, that tells you exactly the number of trips that were used for that particular analysis. So then you can compare that to any other information you know about your, your area, your study area, other traffic count data you may have, other information you know about the population. So that's the way that sort of our customers can sort of individually do that. Um, if there is a bigger question about, you know, an area of the country where you want to dig into this more, you should contact us. It's something that um, our sales engineers or our support team can likely help you think through a bit more. Um, but the bottom line is that it's not drastically different from region to region, and that's one of the goals for Streetlight is that we don't want customers in Texas to feel like the results aren't as good as customers in New York, for example. So we spend a lot of time and energy behind the scenes making sure that there's not gaps in sort of the uh, validity of the results based on where you are. So on a related question somewhat, We've got a question asking, do you do any kind of model to estimate the real number of people on certain roads? Excellent question. So I'd say two things related to that. Um, well, and also, by the way, I've, I've, there's been a lot of questions around validation and this and that. There's one other thing I forgot to mention that. One of the things that Streetlight does with all of our sort of normalization and cleaning up of the raw data is we do look at the population in an area, and we look at the, um, you know, you know, numbers of people that live in different neighborhoods and in different cities and whatnot, and that's part of the normalization and contextualization that we do behind the scenes initially. So I just want to mention that. I forgot to say that earlier. In terms of estimating actual number of vehicles on the roadway, in terms of traffic counts or AADT metrics, we do have an algorithm, a very complicated algorithm, that is giving AADT for roadways. So obviously that's totally separate from anything OD related. It's just, you know, on a roadway, one number, what is the AADT? Uh, and currently we have um, 2017 available. Um, so if you're interested in that, we have information on our website, and um, if you um, work with us for the trial for the OD analytics and you want to learn more about AADT as well at that time, we're happy to um, share that with you then as well. So if someone wants to know, is using AADT when available better than the Streetlight Index? Ooh, that's a good question, and this is diving deep into some intricacies of calibration of the Streetlight Insight results. So for those of you who've never used Streetlight Insight, I apologize if this is getting a little bit too deep. And I think the short answer is um, it really depends upon what you're trying to do. So if you just want traffic count data, literally on a roadway, use ADT. If you are interested in getting like OD results and calibrating it in a different way, we offer a few different ways you can calibrate in a simplified manner to scale up your results to an estimated count. And we have a lot of um, information and recommendations for how to best do that in the system. And you can use either your own traffic count data for the region or Streetlight's AEDT to help calibrate or simply expand your OD results to an estimated count. Um, so in terms of which one is the right one, there's no there's no hard and, and fast answer. It just sort of depends upon what your comfort level is and, and what you're most um, interested in using. But if you are an active customer who's working through this now and you have questions, um, you know, contact our support team, contact your account representative, and we'll help you work through it. And if you're a new customer that's thinking, what the heck is she talking about? Um, don't worry about it for now, and, and this, these are topics that we'll talk to you a lot, a lot more before um, you actually start running analyses. All right, Kat, so we've got a couple questions. I know you touched on them a little, but maybe you can talk um, on a more granular scale about how we take our demographics and apply them to each, like, person based on the data from their census group. So how 
how do we possibly know the details of that person as the demographic significantly change from person to person the same sense of clock? Um, and if we just provide those details on a person level in general. So in terms of inferring demographics, you're right. Inferring it at the individual level is very difficult. So what we actually do is infer it at the household level. So when we infer the likely home place for a phone or a device in our system, we look at the census block that, well, and to take a step back, we actually look a lot more granular at where we believe the home place is, more of like a one, kilo, uh, one kilometer by one kilometer grid, which can sometimes be smaller than a census block, depending upon where you are in the country. Um, and then we, so first we identify where do we think the likely home place is. That in itself is a whole algorithm because we look at where the phone is spending the night, where we see it pinging, and we overlay that with land use to say, is this an appropriate place for somebody to live? Is this a residentially zoned or a mixed-use area? It can't be an airport or a factory. You can't live in those places, right? So there's a whole algorithm that first goes into, let's infer the kind of top, three or five neighborhoods that we think these, this phone could live in. So now we've sort of broken up that phone into likely home places. And then the next thing is we look at all of those household demographics. And we don't say we know absolutely the demographic. We look at a profile. So for people who live in census block A, there is a 20% chance they're from a household that makes less than $50,000. There's a 40% chance they're from a household that makes between 50 and 75. And we do that for race of the household, education of the adult, and also family status. These are all U.S. Census or American Community Survey demographic info that's collected at the block or block group level. So then what we end up with is a bunch of different things. We end up, we have a bunch of potential home places for a device, and we have a bunch of different demographic profiles based on all of those home neighborhoods. So for each individual device, we sort of mash up that those different profiles come up with the most likely demographic profile for that device. And then we aggregate it over all of the people that are doing whatever that behavior is. We're not trying to identify an individual movement, and we hope nobody else is either. What we know is most interesting is for all the people on I-35 in Austin that are trying to get to the zip code, what is the demographic breakup of that whole group of people? So those are the steps we take to get to that final answer. And if you still have further questions on that, folks were asking, again, you know, if you contact us about the trial, we're happy to further discuss it then, or if you're an existing customer, our support team and our support center has a lot of good information about this. So the questions are starting to slow down, um, and we're approaching the top of the hour. I've got one more in my list, so if anyone has any last-minute questions, please be sure to send those in. But the question I've got right now is, are we able to extract OD info based on a series of criteria? For example, trip A, uh, trip path A, then trip, or then B, or trip path A, not B. Does that make sense? I think so. So the answer is, we, I, I think, yes. I think we can, the short answer is yes, <laughs> with some caveats. So the longer answer is, it'd be great to actually sit down and sort of scope out exactly what you're trying to answer there, and then we could talk about how you could use different types of streetlights analytics. We also have a select link analytics that I didn't talk about at all today, um, or maybe run a few different version, a few different types of analytics and combine the results to get to that question, um, or get to that answer rather. So I would say whoever asked that. Um, get in touch with us, and we can kind of scope that out with you more fully for how you could do that. Um, either, again, via our trial email if you're um, a new customer, and if you're an existing customer, that's a great question for our support team to help you out with. Okay. It looks like I'm getting one more question. I just got to pull it up. It went into a different place. Someone's asking, is the data available for pedestrian as well? Um, the short answer is um, not this minute, but it will be very soon. And then another question is, data only is available for roadways, or do you also include parking lots and driveways? Um, um, yes. 
you can run analyses outside of just the road network itself, shopping malls, park and ride, um, things like that, absolutely. Someone wants to know if an area or if visitors are separated from residents, if, there, if that's possible. Um, that's a little bit more of a complicated question, and I would say we should dig into that more. Um, there's a few different ways we, we could get to that with our existing analytics, um, and depending upon what you're trying to answer there, uh, we, yeah, we just need to, we need to just sort of spec it out a little bit more. Um, but obviously everything that we talked today, I was just sort of talking about, you know, general whoever's moving on the roadway. All right. I think I've captured all the questions. I'm going to give people a few more seconds to ask something in case I missed it. But it looks like we're starting to slow down. Oh, here's one. Can you specify a date range of data? This is potentially for before and after analysis. Yes, absolutely. And and that's one of the really exciting things with all of the big data analytics is because all of the data is already stored there. So um, just like I ran just July 2018, I could have easily run um, just the July 4th, a couple of days before and after that, or just the weekends in July, or I could have run all of the weekends in the summer of 2017 and then compared it to all of the weekends in 2018. So very easy to do. Great. All right. Let's see. I think we have answered everybody's questions. Of course, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to email them to us at trial at streetlightdata.com. Uh, as a reminder, we will send out a link to the recording and webinar slides in about 24 hours and a reminder about how to send um, your information for a free trial. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Have you have anything else to add before we hop off? No, thanks, everyone. Great questions. We're excited to have, um, you know, all of you trying this out more and uh, looking forward to, you know, having more conversations with any of you. All right. Thanks, everybody.